think the thing to just bolt on to what you've said is that the sort of the fourth piece of string to this is algorithm. Mm. There's there's algorithmic marketing that's entirely dependent on the four things that you've just mentioned, right? Mm. You have <clears throat> you have people, consumers searching for emotion. You have writers writing for emotion. You have producers, aka you know media outlets and conglomerates searching for money mm -hmm. and then you have algorithm searching for interaction yeah and Absolutely. when yeah. all four of those things can make money mm -hmm. the likelihood of keeping a sanctity of truth is very minimal yeah and i think to your point of there's no easy answer you're right there's no easy answer to end solution or like complete solution however I think one of the first things that can be changed is, is the algorithms, right? Because at the base of all of this, mm -hmm. the, the underwriter is the algorithm. Mm -hmm. If the algorithm wasn't um, determining that what was being presented to you was something that was going to trigger an emotion, yeah. especially a, a heavily reactive emotion, then the precedent would be shifted slightly and it would be less profitable mm -hmm. both tangibly and intangibly for mm -hmm. the other three strands to either look for or organize writing that would you know, elicit such a, re a reactive response um however mm -hmm. uh, as it seems that the algorithm is our current overlord, I think the last, uh, the last yeah, challenge I mean, probably. I think that's a, that's a really good point, and I think I mean there there have been some efforts to do things like that, particularly with regard to information about COVID. Mm -hmm. I think um, there's been sort of an acknowledgement that some of the misinformation doing the rounds is not in the public interest and actually. Comp potentially compromises public health mm -hmm. and I think some of the algorithm designers have they've looked at ways to maybe flag some of the misinformation and sort of make people um, think more carefully before engaging in some of the things that are going around um, and maybe to I mean again I don't know the details of that um, like I say I'm, I'm seeing that the way that people are interacting with some of that information around COVID um, has been different you know I think there's been efforts to make sure that people are signposted towards good sources of information um, as well as you know what may be being presented on there and grabbing people's attention so I think that there are people are people are exploring ways to do this I'm not sure that that's happening in a sort of coherent sense across the board um, it would be interesting to see sort of the outcomes of those individual cases you know I think again you know uh, in so many ways covid has been um almost a test bed for, for for lots of new ideas as things have come through you know i think it's it's really sparked um a, a need for change in lots of areas um, i think i mean crisis crises tend to drive change in general you know i think in times of crisis you see change taking place in in weeks and months that might in ordinary time take much longer so I think because of that you know things have been pushed through and I mean that's that comes with opportunities and costs right I think there are some senses in which that's not a good thing and you know we've talked about the issues that the health service are facing um some of the the real challenges there um and like I said I, I you know the, the frustrations that I have when I'm trying to sort of point out some of the problems with the way that we're going and you know the worry that we're going to end up being pushed down a route that maybe isn't best for people um, but at the same time there's opportunities and there's opportunities to explore things that maybe we wouldn't otherwise and again I, I wonder whether you know some of those um, things that are being tried could then be developed in other ways so it'll be interesting um i agree 
I agree. And I think that nicely moves us on to the the actual question I had for today, which was, you know, the one thing that, that COVID has shown me specifically is the 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 furthering of division within communities, right? And and I think this is uh, a byproduct of the lockdown and the social distancing stuff. Um, you, 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 you touched on earlier, when we were in hunter-gatherer small communities, it was absolutely pertinent for us to focus on the things that were scary or fearful or would make us angry or, you know, elicited such a, uh, an aggravated emotional response. However, one of the things that I feel has changed quite dramatically is that now the, the thing that elicits such a remote response is being with people, right? Being in the presence of people. You know, I, I've seen from getting the tube or just walking around my local district, the way that people interact with each other is, is that it's uncommon to be around people, mm. right? It's uncommon to um, have somebody within two feet of you, three feet of you, whatever it is. Um, as a policy maker, and we, we can talk about all the subsidiary effects of, of what that would do to society or what that is, has doing, how do you feel like we combat that? I think this is a really big question because I think there's a lot of different things going on here to unpick. Um, I think the pandemic and the messaging that people have received over the pandemic and you know the effects of lockdown, that's had a number of effects. Um, mm -hmm. I think one is it's driven a lot of interaction online during the lockdown. I think people have been engaged more via Zoom, for example, um, as well as via social media. And Obviously, there are opportunities there, you know, the, the ability to go to meetings and go to lectures that are happening on the other side of the world, um, you know, to meet people. Um, I mean, there's, there's been the ability to do that for, for quite a while, but it's become normalised. Um, and in some ways, that's, that's a really good thing. There's lots of opportunities there. But I think the problem is it's not the same as being in a room with people and our brains don't react to it in the same way as being in a room with people. Um, I mean, something I've noticed is that council meetings, for example, get a lot more fractious and there's a, a lot more irritable, for want of a word, when they're happening online than when you're in person. I think when you're in person, even with people who um, are on the opposite team, if you like, there's still that human interaction at a, at a human level. You know, it's like we might not agree about lots of things, but as a, I, I recognise you as a person. I think as soon as you move that online, you lose some of that because that sort of sense of it, it, our brains in, it, in exactly the same way that people tend to be more rude to each other on social media than they yes. would if they were having that conversation face to face in somebody's living room or in the pub. Um, you know, we've we've evolved ways of interacting with people face to face without wanting to kill each other all the time. You know, we, we, we've got those mechanisms we haven't got those mechanisms online yet because we haven't you know our brains haven't caught up with the technology 